We stand. Our reading today is from Luke 1, 13 to 17. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You may be dismissed, and our kids can be dismissed. We can be fitted. Okay, back. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, if you open to Matthew chapter 3. As we begin our study today, we're going to be titling our message, Preparing the Way. Preparing the Way. Father, we ask that you would prepare our hearts, Lord, as we study your word and guide us through the scriptures. Guide us into your presence. Guide us into uh, the place, Lord, where we are uh, meeting with you, sitting with you, hearing your voice and growing closer and closer to you. And we just ask that your word would speak to our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, the first two chapters of Matthew that we've covered so far were specifically about the birth of Jesus and then the coming of the wise men. So we know Jesus was about two years old about that time frame. And we saw Herod's reaction to the king of the Jews being born and his ill attempt to try to stop God's plan that was spoken hundreds of years earlier by the prophets. And as we go through this study, we'll see others try to stand against God's plan. All for naught. You can't disrupt God's plan. You can be a thorn in a lot of people's lives as God's doing His work, but you can't stop His work. He will accomplish what He sets forth to do. In Psalm 33:10, we read, The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He makes the plans of the peoples of no effect. In Psalm 33, 11, we read, The counsel of the Lord stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. So as we begin our study here in Matthew chapter 3, we've jumped forward from chapter 1 and chapter 2, now 28 to 29 years from where we left off before. Jesus would now be about 30 years old, and he's about to be announced as the Savior of the world. Matthew chapter 3, beginning with verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord. Make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. So what do we know about John? Well, the scripture reading, reading we just read was, pretty powerful indication of who John is and who John was going to be. And we find a good bit about him more in Luke's account of the gospel. And first, we know that he had a plan for his life before he was born. Isn't that encouraging? Before we were even born, before we were conceived in our mother's womb, God had a plan for our lives. He had a plan for John's life. And he directed every step and every path in Elizabeth and Zachariah's life in order for this to happen, in order for all of this to take place the way God intended it for it to be. And in Luke 1, 13 through 17, we read, But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, 
and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will return many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will also go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. So we know that God had a plan for his life. We know that God had given that vision to Zacharias and Zacharias didn't quite believe it so he became mute until the time that the baby would be born. We also know that John was related to Jesus. This is a story also we find in Luke. Mary and Elizabeth were cousins. Now, it says cousins in the King James Version. It says uh, uh, they were relatives in the New King James, but uh, uh, Luke one thirty six in the King James Version says, And behold thy cousin, Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. See, that's the other thing, too, when you think about this. They were pretty much, as Abraham and Sarah, they were pretty much barren. They had no children. They were past the age. But God hadn't stopped on his plan. He was preparing them for what's about to happen to have this baby. And we see in verse 15 that he's filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Now, that's pretty powerful that he was filled in the Spirit in his mother's womb. God had his hand upon him all the way through his life. Luke 1, 39 through 41 gives us this evidence. It says, Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary that the babe leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. So both Elizabeth... And John were filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, that was a powerful moment. You know, she spoke out a prophetic word, but that baby knew. The babe knew what was, it, what was in his presence, that Jesus himself in the womb of Mary was in his presence, and he leaped in the womb. And we see in verse 17 that he will go forth in the spirit of Elijah. He even appeared to look somewhat like Elijah. In 2 Kings 1, 7-8, It says, when King Isaiah fell through the roof and was injured, he didn't inquire of the Lord. And God sent Elijah to pronounce judgment. In verse 7 there, it says, Then he said to him, What kind of man was it who came up to meet you and told you these words? So they answered him, A hairy man, wearing a leather belt around his waist. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. So he came in the spirit of Elijah, but he also dressed like Elijah. He had the belt around his waist, and he wore camel's hair as a hairy man appeared. And Jesus spoke about the spirit of Elijah's coming. In Matthew 17, 10 through 13, we read, And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? And Jesus answered and said to them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first, and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah has come already. And they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. So John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah, just as it was prophesied that he would. And he was spoken of by Isaiah the prophet in Isaiah 40, verses 3 through 4. The voice of one crying in the wilderness... Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. So everything that was prophesied about John, everything that was uh, given by the angel to, uh, to Zacharias and everything that was to take place has now happened it's all come to be and John now is grown John is now grown as we move into the next phase of our of our lesson here and and we see that with God appointing all this to happen and the Holy Spirit in John from his birth and all of these things there's one thing that we still have to take note of 
and that is that John chose to be obedient. He chose to be obedient. God called him, but he calls all of us. God calls all of us. He has a plan for each one of our lives. But we have to have the responsibility to step up and say, I will be obedient to the call. Now, you may not feel worthy of the call. Believe me, I understand that. None of us feel worthy of the call that God places upon our lives. And none of us in our flesh are worthy because we're going to fall. And we're going to make mistakes. And we're going to do things not according to God's plan. But if it's God's plan and we're obedient to Him, He will bring it to pass. Not to glorify us, because John was never to be glorified. Even himself, he said, hey, you know, it's no longer about me. We're now, we're going to be pointing to Jesus, and that's going to be coming up in our study. So John understood from the very beginning, that, hey, I've got a role here. And this role is preparing the way of the Lord. Not that I get glory, not that it's all about me, but it's all about doing what God called me to do, because Jesus is here. And Jesus is going to be coming down here within the next few days. And so John is out here, and he's doing what he was called to do, but he was obedient to that call. And that's so important for us to understand because I truly believe that God has a plan for every one of our lives. But sometimes we get in the way of that plan, and it takes a lot longer for God to accomplish that plan because we seem to have our own ideas about how to make it happen or not make it happen in some cases. Now, we don't know if John knew ahead of time that he was going to be beheaded for this message that he's bringing. We don't know what John knew, what he didn't know about the future, because sometimes God does give us a lot of insight about what's going to happen to us and gives us insight about the ministry that we have. But he also leaves a lot of things out, and you can all testify to that. If you've heard from the Lord, sometimes it takes a little bit of time for that, that vision or plan to take place and to, and to be accomplished in our lives. And usually, it's because we're in the way. But oftentimes, it's because he's still aligning things around us that we don't see. And that's that dry period. That's that, that period of waiting. When you know you've heard from the Lord, but then all of a sudden, it's like silence. Now what? Now what? Well, John's about 30 years old. How many years of silence do you think he may have had before his time came? And he came out calling, preparing the way of the Lord. He was chosen to be the one to go and prepare the way. This was his calling. And today we're all called to be a light into the world, pointing to Jesus. John's call was not unique to the church. It was unique at the time. But now that Jesus has come, and he died and rose again, and ascended on high, he's given the light to the church. He's given the light to us that we go forth and prepare the way of others that don't know Him or maybe encouraging those who have slipped in, and fallen into a place where they need to be lifted out because God has a plan for their life and He wants them to know Him. Now, some have specific calls such as pastors or teachers, preachers or evangelists, but these are not jobs that men choose. And I really am bothered by those pastors particularly who say, well, I've got a job. This is my job. I'm a pastor. No, that's not your job. You're called. You're appointed. It's not a job. It's not something that we pick up and say, I've got to go earn my money on Sunday and preach a real good message. Well, if that were the case, most of us would really be broke. Y'all laughing a little too hard at that. You've heard my messages. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The thing is, is that they're not my. Me it's not my message. It's not a pastor's message. Yeah, you study, you put your time into it. You 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 listen to the Lord as He's leading. But He's the one that's putting the pa the message together. And anybody that ever thinks it's otherwise, He's already on the wrong side of the coin, because pride has entered in. To think that I could preach a message that's going to change a heart? No, I can't preach anything except be a willing vessel that God preached through me. Let His Word touch the heart. Let the Holy Spirit bring per uh, the person closer to Him. And let me be a willing vessel and then get out of the way. 
so that I don't make an issue about what I'm doing. It's not a job. It's a calling. And we should never treat it that way. We should all walk by the leading of the Holy Spirit, not man's plans and schemes. And John was a grown man that had been being prepared for 30 years for this very moment. For this time, such a time as this, and we don't have any biblical account of his childhood, but we know that everything he experienced in his life up to this point was for this time, for this moment when he was called to do what he was called to do. And let this be an encouragement for us this morning. God will use everything in your life to bring you where he wants you to be. And that's not an easy word to hear sometimes. And we had our prayer time this morning, and I, I heard your hearts pouring out to the Lord for various things, and it's hard. Life is hard. And we hurt for those that we love, and we hurt for, for things in our life, and, and we go through these things. But, but I'm telling you, and I believe this with all of my heart, that God uses everything in your life to bring you where He wants you to be. Even the hardest moments, He's using for your good. When you don't see it, when you don't feel it, when you feel isolated, alone, that's when God's moving the best because you're just kind of quiet. <laughs> and He can do His work and He can make things happen. But the good and the bad and the happy and the sad, God's still working. He doesn't stop because of our insufficiency. He doesn't stop because of our faithlessness. He doesn't stop because of our sin. But when we come back in repentance and we move closer to Him and we're walking in that relationship, He's preparing that moment or moments for us to be right where we're supposed to be when we're supposed to be there. And again, we look at these stories in the Bible and we say, wow, you know, you can see all of this stuff happening, how God used and how God did this. He's doing the same thing right now in each one of us. These people were not special people because of anything that they had or didn't have. God chose them. He used them. But He chooses us, and He uses us. And we have to come to that place to understand that we're not special because we have something to offer. We're special because we're the apple of His eye. And He has something to offer in us, to us, through us, to be used for His glory in this dark world that we live in. And I believe that John is a good example of Romans 8, 28. When we say, we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those who call according to His purpose because He was living His life as God was doing what He had to do in His life. And again, we don't have a record of everything that there was, but I'm fairly sure that he had some hard times in 30 years. Because he had to be broken too, to be used. His flesh couldn't be in the way. And that's something for us to look at. No matter what our circumstance, no matter what our lives look like in our eyes, he's working for the good if you love him. And it will be a positive outcome. We just have to go through it. And verses 5 through 6. Then Jerusalem, all Judea, and all the region around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sin. Now this is something that we don't want to miss here. John wasn't saving them when he baptized them. John had no power of salvation. But he was baptizing them, what? Into repentance. They were coming because... The Holy Spirit was in John. He was in him when he was in, in his womb, in, in his mother's womb. He's in him now. He's not coming out proclaiming on his own. He's doing what God called him to do, and the Holy Spirit is in him. And as he's preaching this message, you know, hey, repent. People are responding to the message, not because of John, but because of the Holy Spirit in John and we all know and we've, we've, we've heard this message before that it's the Holy Spirit that, that touches the hearts of the people and brings them 
to salvation and brings them to repentance. So he wasn't baptizing them into salvation. It was a baptism of repentance. And he was truly preparing the hearts to receive salvation when Jesus came. Which gives us another really important point, which is you can't receive salvation without repentance. Very, very important point because many times there's a, an emotional moment and people pray a prayer and they, that's it for them. They've done it. It's over. It's just like check mark on the list. And, but there was no repentance because they haven't been taught that they need to repent. John was telling people on the front end, hey, you need to repent of your sins. Well, to repent from sin means you need to recognize you are a sinner and that you have to turn from that sin and go a different direction. A different direction. And he was preparing the hearts for Jesus. He was making the path straight, exactly what he was called to do. The paths were all crooked because people were walking their own way, doing their own thing. But as he preached the word to repent, the paths became straight to the ones who would receive when Jesus came. Acts 19, 1 through 6. And it happened while Apollos was at Corinth that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus. And finding some, some disciples, he said to them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, We've not so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said to them, Into what then were you baptized? So they said, Into John's baptism. Then Paul said, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. They didn't know anything about the Holy Spirit. They didn't really know anything about salvation. But they were disciples. They were following, but they didn't really know what they were following. And Paul put them straight and said, Hey, well, well tell, me, tell me about your, your, your Christian walk. Tell me about your experience. Well, we were baptized into repentance, into John's baptism. Oh, man. Well, there's a whole lot more you hadn't heard yet. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you about the true reason why John was baptized into repentance. He's now opened the door for you walking in repentance to receive Jesus Christ, who will be your salvation. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. And they received him that day. John was saying, All you who know you are sinners, come and repent, for the Lord is at hand. If you don't know you're a sinner, don't bother coming. Really, that's, that's the bottom line of it. If you haven't recognized that you're a sinner and you need to repent, there's really no purpose in you coming to be baptized into repentance. And he pretty well stood on that ground. And again, remember, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And many came to John and be baptized, not because of John, but because of the Holy Spirit drawing them. He had opened their ears to hear the truth. And it's the same way today. Many men make eloquent speeches and use emotional tactics to draw a crowd, but true repentance comes by the drawing of the Holy Spirit. Always. There's no exception. And don't ever believe that a man can save another man by his words. You can preach a good message and you can say a lot of the right things. You can do all of the right things. You can browbeat them. You can do all kinds of stuff. But if it's not by the Holy Spirit behind those words, speaking the message through the individual, then it's just words. It could be a great show, good entertainment, a great speech, a great positive motivational meeting. But if the Holy Spirit's not in it, people will come and they'll clap. Oh, wow. Did you hear the wonderful message? Wasn't that powerful? Did it change your life? Well, I mean, you know. But it was good. I'd pay to go see it again. Pass the plate again. Let's do it three or four times. Good message. The Holy Spirit wants to be the one doing the work and we just need to be a willing vessel used by the Lord to accomplish his will that's the simplicity of it too many times we we really want to go out and make plans and 
do things and accomplish this and accomplish that. But I think that, and we're seeing this in this community, we're seeing it even in our church, that, that prayer is going to make that difference. It's going to be prayer. It's going to be focusing on the Lord. It's going to be getting out of the way, letting the Holy Spirit do the work in us, and then He will place us where He wants us to be, to be used and to accomplish His will. Paul understood this in 1 Corinthians 2, 4. He said, In my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words or human wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Demonstration of the Spirit and of power. How did he demonstrate it? He just let it happen. He didn't get in the way of it. He let God work through him. In 1 Corinthians 2, 13, says, These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Paul understood it. John understood it. And this is something that we can grasp for ourselves today. Be prepared to be used by getting out of the way. And just say, I'm open, Lord. I'm open. I want to empty myself of everything within me that causes me to want to fix something. That causes me to want to change something. That causes me to want to go out and, uh, and do some big ministry for you. Let me get out of the way of that. If that's your plan for my life, I want to be available for it. But I don't want to go do it because I want it. I want to be empty of myself so that you can pour it into me and you can accomplish it. And there's been a lot of big things that have happened. Things happen around the country. Things happen around the world. We see and hear of, of big things rising up. But we have to test the spirits. We have to watch it. We have to pay attention to, to know, is this the Holy Spirit doing this work? Do we want to be a part of that work? And so many times a new book will come out or a, 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 a new revival or something happening and it sweeps across the country and everybody wants to jump onto it and like you're hanging on. We're to hang on to Jesus. If that movement is of Him and He wants us to be a part of it, He will, sw he will wash over us with it. We don't have to go seek it out. But there's been a lot of duplicity that's happened in some of these revival things. They want to duplicate it. They want to create it. And what may have begun in the Holy Spirit sometimes remains driven by man. And it, again, it has appearance of godliness, but God's not in it. And so we have to be very careful that we don't align ourselves with things that just because they're popular, just because they're good, just because something's happening, okay, that's wonderful, but maybe God's got a new work for you, for us. Or maybe He's going to start something that's going to explode in a small little church like ours that could, that could turn into something huge across the nation. But I would encourage anyone who sees it they also need to pray that that's what God wants them to get involved in and do it. If not, then let God do what He wants to do, where He wants to do it, and you just be a willing vessel. Go along with what He wants us to do. We always have to remember it's God working through us, and usually that's in spite of ourselves. Because we have a lot of pride. And we have a lot of things that can get in the way of what He wants to do. Verses 7 through 10. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, Brood of vipers, who warn you to flee from the wrath to come? Therefore bear fruits worthy of repentance. And do not think to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. John didn't mention any words here. He saw them coming. Filled with the Holy Spirit, he knew their hearts. They weren't there because they wanted to repent from anything. 
they were there curiously watching to see, is this guy really going to do things according to our traditions? Is he really called by God? Well, we're not so sure of it. And so they came out, and they were watching, and he saw them, and he calls them brood of vipers. And it may seem harsh at first glance, but again, remember, he's filled with the Holy Spirit. He saw what he saw. He knew who they were. Full of religion and full of pride, but their hearts were hardened as stone. And John is right off the bat holding their feet to the fire. That's what Jesus did. He held their feet to the fire. Jesus would also call them brood of vipers. In Matthew 12, 34, he says, Brood of vipers, how can you be in evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And again, in Matthew 23, 33, he said, Serpents, brood of vipers, how can you escape the condemnation of hell? And who is he talking to? The scribes, the Pharisees, the leaders. That's who Jesus was talking to. This is who John is talking to. They were very pious. They were very poised. They wore the right clothes, the robes. They looked good. But they had traditions of men that had nothing to do with the relationship with God. And that's what they were hanging their hat on. So much to the point that they were so convinced that they were so right with God in their religiosity that they couldn't even see their Messiah when he came in front of them. They missed it. Brood of vipers. And John addresses the root of their pride regarding them being the sons of Abraham. See, they stood on that same ground with Jesus as well. This was a huge insult to them because they have the natural heritage of being Abraham's descendants. And that was part of their pride. We know that, that we're of ch uh, children of Abraham, so therefore we're right with God. That, that's how they looked at their lives. It didn't matter about obedience. It didn't matter about love and kindness. It didn't matter about loving God with your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and then loving your neighbors yourself. None of that really mattered. We have the heritage. That's what they were looking at. We have it all. We have the tradition. We have the heritage. So therefore, we are right with God. And anybody who comes on the scene, otherwise, I'm sorry, you're, you're not. And we're not listening. Spiritually, their hearts were hard and cold. And they couldn't receive the message of repentance because truly I believe they didn't think they needed to repent for anything. They thought their mom and daddy's family and grandpa and grandma and going all the way back the line, that's our heritage. That's our church. We don't need anything else. We've, we've been Christians all our life. We've been this all our life. We've had this all our life. This is the attitude that can get you in a lot of trouble. Because you may have had a heritage in your own life of very strong Christian men and women that went on before us. And that's wonderful for them. But if your heart's not right with the Lord, if it's not a relationship between you and Jesus, it's all for naught. Doesn't matter. Well, this is where these, uh, these descendants of Abraham were. They were so... Uh, involved in their heritage and their pride of who they came from that they weren't able to see that they were still sinners. They were still sinners. They were in pride and walked in pride instead of humility. And again, Jesus hit them on this very point. In John chapter 8, 37 through 47 we read, I know that you're Abraham's descendants, and this is Jesus speaking, but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I've seen with my father, and you do what you have seen with your father. And they answered and said to him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham, but now you seek to kill me. A man who has told you the truth which I heard from God. Abraham did not do this. You do the deeds of your father. 
Then they said to him, We were not born of fornication. We have one Father, God. And Jesus said to them, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speech? I love it when Jesus said that. Do I need to talk a little slower? Is my accent too southern? Why do you not understand my speech? Because you're not able to listen to my word. You are of your father, the devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. But because I tell the truth, you do not believe me. Which of you convicts me of sin? But if I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? He who is of God hears God's words. Therefore you do not hear, because you are not of God. Again, pretty blunt words. Strong words. But we've read in Scripture before, all the way back to when Samuel was going and looking to raise up the king from Jesse's house. And he looked at the tall ones and the handsome ones, and he went through them all, and, and God said, nope, that's not the one. Nope, that's not the one. And he says, is there anybody left? We got this scrawny little shepherd boy. He's out with the sheep. Well, bring him in. That's the one God chose. God always looks at the heart. He always looks at the heart. And this is what Jesus was doing. And this is what John the Baptist was doing. The Holy Spirit in him revealed the heart of those that were coming. And those who came with true repentance in their heart, he baptized them. And those who came and stood off on the shoreline and, and probably had scowls on their faces, he called them out. The attitude of your heart is not right. You who believe that you don't have any sin, you who believe that in your pride and your ancestry you have it all together, you who believe you're the children of Abraham, these rocks, these stones can be raised up to be children of Abraham. And in their hearts, they were stones they were coal John the Baptist knew it Jesus knew it and he called them out and he let them know that your pride your heritage your genealogy your mom and daddy's church that you've been in for 40 years not going to save you not going to do anything for you except sustain your pride. For us this morning, we need to see that it's not our ancestry or our parents' religion or even the church that we attend that brings us salvation. Because you can be going to a godly church, a church that's preaching the Word, that's led by the Holy Spirit, that's doing exactly what God wants them to do. And you can be involved in that church. You can be going to that church. But if you're going because it's a comfortable place for you to go, but you have not had a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's all in vain. It's all in vain. It's through Jesus. Now, it's a wonderful thing to have been raised in a Christian home if you had that opportunity, if God allowed that to be in your home. It's a wonderful thing to know that your mom and dad prayed for you. It's a wonderful thing that they took you to Sunday school and you went to class and you learned the lessons of, of the Bible and the people of the Bible, the heroes of the Bible. This is a wonderful thing. But unless we humble ourselves before the Lord and confess that we're sinners and then we repent from our own sins, Repent from our own sins. We're no different than these Pharisees and Sadducees. And our pride will be our downfall. So important for us to understand this morning what John was doing and why he was doing it. 
He was doing it because God called him to do so before he was even born. He infilled him with the Holy Spirit to be able to accomplish what God called him to do. John didn't go out in his own, own flesh. He was walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And he was called to prepare the way for the one to come. For Jesus is coming. And when he comes, all attention will go to him. John understood that too. He knew he was just a, a vessel being used to the point of introducing the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the sacrificial lamb, the one who's to come to take upon himself the sins of the world. John knew that. And he didn't allow pride to get in the way of his message. He didn't try to draw attention to himself and say, hey, I know Jesus is coming, but right now you got me. I'm the one. It wasn't his heart. He just wanted to be obedient. Just wanted to follow through and do what God called him to do. Today, all of us struggle in our lives with something. It could be a big sin. It could be a, a shadow sin. It could be something. But for many of us, it's rooted in pride. And pride is the thing that keeps us bound up. Pride is the thing that keeps us from confessing. Pride is the thing that keeps us from saying, okay, I really have come to the end of myself. And I'm laying that down. And I'm allowing now the Holy Spirit to work, to bring healing, to bring change, and to bring direction and vision. Because God has a plan. And each one of us here are part of his plan. And even though we've stood in the way of it ourselves many times. So the message this morning is let's get out of the way. And let's see what God will do. But when you're getting out of the way, don't think that you're going to just get out of the will. <laughs> getting out of the way doesn't mean getting out of the will. Getting out of the way means, okay, I'm now going to stand in your will, but I'm no longer going to oppose it or try to direct it or try to be in charge of it. I'm just out of the way, and here I am. Empty of myself that you may fill me with your spirit, and I may go forth and prepare the way for others that don't know you. And there are many out. There are many. We'll walk at this front door. They're all over the parking lot. They're all over the street. They're all over in these stores. They're everywhere. And there are many believers out there too. And God is using all of the believers who have a heart for Him. And that's another thing that we can be encouraged with. You're not the only one. God wants to use you, but you're not the only one. And as you begin to understand that you don't need to take on the burden of the world. You just need to take on Jesus and clothe yourself in Him and be filled with His Holy Spirit and be available and He will work with you one-on-one, one-on-ten, -on -one, one-on-fifty, -on -one whatever it might be. But He will be doing the work. Let's stand in the place of repentance and let's stand in the place of humility and then let's be used as God sees fit. And as we get into our message next week, we're going to see Jesus as he's coming and his ministry begins. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you uh, do have a plan. We thank you, Lord, that you are drawing us into your plan. And Father, it's, it's, it can be overwhelming when we know what we struggle with in our own lives. We want to flee. We want to run. We want to hide. We want to turn away. We don't want to... Uh, how can you use us? How can you ever use us, Lord? Well, we can't answer the fullness in our finite minds of the fact that you loved us enough to send your Son. And you gave us salvation because you loved us, not because we deserved it. Not because we had something within ourselves that you thought was a good thing and you can use. If anything, those have to be wiped away so you can fill us with your Spirit to do what you want us to do. So God, it's not about our worthiness. It's not about our abilities. It's not about our own desires. It's, it's about submission. It's about humility. 
and it's about obedience. And so we put all that stuff at your feet this morning, Lord, and we choose to get out of the way. May your spirit shine through us. Let us be the light. Let us be the light in this world. You put us here for a reason, Lord. You've left us here for a reason. And one of those reasons is to be a light in a dark place. Let's not, let us not forget that. Let us not forget where we came from. But also let us not remain in guilt and fear and anguish over where we've come. But walk in the pleasantness of the relationship we have with you. In forgiveness and in peace and joy and the fruit of the Spirit that you pour into us, Lord. All the fruits of the Spirit you pour into us. And let us be ready. We love you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. And all God's people said, Amen.